Greetings, my fellow freedom love sovereign thinkers. This is LL3's newest podcast. My name is Craig, transmitting from the beautiful swampy makers of South Florida. And today's date is Wednesday, May 23rd, 2018. Yeah, I'm just kicking back right now. I'm at the uh, uh, little hotel on the beautiful little beach. Cloudy, somewhat sunny. I said, what the hell? Let me just take some time off. So uh, I've been working a lot, and hey, it's just uh, one of those things. And I noticed, too, people are still talking about the Santa Fe shootings that happened in Texas, in Harris County to be exact. Just been doing a little homework on it, and I'm not going to be really mainly discussing, uh, make an episode on that. But uh, one thing I can say for sure of course, there's been reports that he's been bullied by um, folks in the staff, like PE coaches and all that, because of his body odor. Maybe a strange uh, individual, probably mind controlled. I'm looking at that as well. And it occurred in the firearm free zone in the state of Texas. I looked at the site called uh, US Gun Laws. The gun, uh, the, handgunlaws.us you can, it's a real good site and actually um, you can look at the state of Texas folks just look it up and one thing for sure even though they have um, campus carry but when it comes to secondary schools and grammar school it's prohibited so it's another soft target and he took the, he got the farms from his father allegedly and even um, explosives and there was a claim from Project N Search. Stu Webb and Patrick Hannigan, Patrick Hannigan or Tom Hannigan, one of those individuals. I sometimes always get these names mixed up. Talk about a possible paramilitary connection. And I, I do recall reading Behold a Pale Horse and page two twenty five talked about that. About military supplying doing uh, firearms to people, make it easier, and plus do these shootings, have people resist and give up their natural-born rights to bear arms. That was one of those areas you have to really pay attention to. You see a pattern here. It's getting a little bit too obvious. And in addition to Sheriff Gonzalez, Harris County Sheriff Gonzalez, is a member of Homeland Security because he did preside it in his county, if I'm correct. I could be mistaken. Is involved with the Homeland Security Committee. So another federalized sheriff. You see, you see what's happening here. Something you have to really pay attention to, my friends. And of course, going to have March for Our Lives. You know that was part of a CA corporation that started it all, based out of Plantation, Florida. Gonna go and push for this, and we're with you. We want the government to protect us. And I can see this one guy wearing a shirt on the billboards, billboard music awards. It says protect, it's cross out guns and kids. Protect kids. I'm just mind boggled at times when folks are not really that literate when it comes to protecting kids or having government knows best. Sovereign immunity tort liability is a big thing. And technically, public employees don't have this, are not obligated, or not, or are not liable on certain actions, like if you dial 911. If the police comes in and it's too late, and it, and you may be injured or murdered, and the air is trying to sue the police for not protecting you. It will be tossed out. Sovereign immunity tort liability. If Florida has a good one. Injured is an example. Florida statute 768.28. Sovereign immunity tort liability act. Look it up. There's plenty of cases out there. Pertaining to that. Now, I know I, I repeat myself a few times. From my regular listeners. I'm saying. Hey. Wong versus the city of Miami 1970. Florida Supreme Court decision. 
Secondly, the police aren't obligated to protect us as an individual. And people say, oh, but even the U.S. Supreme Court says the same thing. I knew that. But I'm going to state level, get more detail. This is why I get real bit touchy. And of course, I had a co-worker of mine's a daughter who was at Parkland when all that happened. Now he wants to ban AR-15, this and that, and Parkland Strong. I say this. Parkland Strong, Santa Fe Strong, don't go do it by endorsing tyranny. It may sound pretty, but the fine print is extremely treacherous. That can actually terminate you and your loved ones. You can ban whatever you want, but here's one thing for sure. Then you create a black market instrument, to be exact. Great example happened in the Guardians. Look up firearms being smuggled in for terrorists. In Europe, areas of Europe has one of the toughest firearm laws in the world. Didn't achieve anything. Or look up prohibition error. When the United States had a constitution amendment of prohibiting alcohol sales. How far that worked out. Didn't achieve a damn thing. Nullification of the states and municipalities made that amendment repealed. So you can go to President Trump, Washington, D.C., go protect our kids. It's not 100% guaranteed. And if they don't, you believe you're going to sue them for not protecting your kids in school? They're just going to send you a piece of paper saying it, nothing can be done according to the Sovereign Immunity and Tort Liability Act. Whether it's federal, state, or local. Mark my words on that, my friends. It goes a lot further. And I have talked about this Many multiple topics, different avenues, with reference to Parkland. Just go to my archives and a lot of the information I provided, thanks to others, we share, we share a lot, made it relevant. All right, so enough of that. And of course, another shooting that happened in Panama City. Anything with guns, they go. All hell breaks loose. But well, tonight for fist fight, who the hell cares, right? That's not attractive enough. Remember, they want to put their fear into every single one of us. Not just the United States, but around the world. Never again, right? Hey, we should stop supplying Saudi Arabia for destroying Yemen. That's okay. It's exceptional. They're our friends. Of course, even reports happen in Israel. Oh, if we get real critical, criticizing rogue elements in the government, you can be labeled anti-Semitic. Spare me. That's all being thinned out. People aren't buying the propaganda matrix. So... Without further ado, I'm going to be talking on a couple things, mainly Middle East, oh, interesting thing come on Monsanto, and of course the resistance is losing. The only direction did that. I said, what the heck? So, this one here came from newsreviews.com, came out today. It's entitled, Regime Change is Coming to Iran. Hallelujah. They are real wicked people over there because Israel said so. We all wear cowbells around our necks, though. Yeah, blah, 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 boo. Her conformity 101. Well, I'll continue on here. This is by Elmi Imani. Despite easing down, the sporadic protests have been going across Iran and has been widely energized by the words of support from President Donald Trump and the hope for more substantial support. 
despite its vast oil, oil and gas resources, the Iranian economy is in shambles. More than three decades of rule by the Islamic Republic of Iran has not only failed to achieve the security and well-being of its people, it has ensnared the nation in a stifling theocracy where the rights of the governor are routinely violated for the benefit of the governing. Revolution in 1979 brought, that brought down Mohammad Raza Shah in the hope of instituting a democratic government was quickly usurped by a religious atro atrocity autocracy excuse me for the past 40 years the Islamic Republic response to legitimate peaceful protest and demand of the people has been an iron fist and the form of heartless beatings of the demonstrators both men and women they have been arrested torture, rape of some of the secretive compounds and even shootings of unarmed in the streets, a standard stock of dictatorships, yet the surest way of swelling and solidifying the ranks of dissenters. The time has arrived to end the Mullah's reign of terror. Unfortunately, both New York Times and Washington Post, who have offices in Tehran and other liberal news medias, are not reporting accurate stories from inside Iran. Millions of Iranians from all walks of life are gearing up to end this horrific nightmare. President Trump has a historic mission to redeem a flawed policy followed by his predecessor, President Obama, in 2009, when the streets of Tehran were chanting, Obama, are you with us or with them? Regrettably, President Obama stayed with the mullahs, which emboldened them to mascara the protesters. The eternal dynamics within Iranian embassy and society has drastically changed. Iran no longer fears the brutal mullahs and demand regime change. These protests have become mainstream. Even students from elementary school students in remote villages dare to say death to Khomeini. Those Islamic rulers are aware they are slowly losing complete legitimacy by many accounts. It has no legitimacy and will be toppled in a violent confrontation with similarly sized demonstrations. There are maybe a handful of regime officials who are struggling activists for reform, but the entire Islamic regime is aware of the looming threat from their citizenry. The Mullah's regime still exists because the U.S. and its allies have failed to pursue a workable strategy to end it. It is, at best, appeasement to make any deal with the sworn enemy of the United States of America. How clearly and how often do the Mullahs have proclaimed their irreconcilable and irreversible hostility toward the U.S. and Israel? These Mullahs believe their own delusions of grandeur. They think that they can win their brinkmanship, and they do firmly believe they will outsmart America, rest of the world, and will have their way in the process. They are more than willing to do whatever services their objective by any and all devious means. Dealing with the mullahs bring to peace in mind the peace in our time that Chamberlain brought to England by his deal making with the Fuhrer, except this this time the state the stakes can be much higher and deadlier. I am personally opposed to any military action in Iran, so that's out. Let's be reminded that we have invaluable allies on the ground in Iran. There are 50 million Iranians who are best hope of the, wor of the world and not part of the world. These enlightenment, enlightened Iranians despise the mullahs and have no animosity toward Israel or the United States, most of these people are well-educated and smart and have broken away from slavery and fraud of Islam Islamism. They are in the best position to send the mullahs packing for good, instead of throwing a lifeline to a sinking ship of the mullahocracy, mul we must act result resolutely and doing everything to non violent to help them defeat the mullahs, it is our best bet. The only viable approach is not half-hearted, but full court press restrictive economic measures against the Islamic rulers. Unfortunately, it will make the Iranian people, particularly those outside the ruling apparatus, apparatus, suffer hugely. Yet, a temporary hurt of this nature is the price that people are willing to pay to get rid of the scourge that is the IRI. And, and by full measure, I mean just that, a complete, unreliable crippling of the oil industry and all banking operations. 
Severus shut down of the Persian Gulf states back door for the Mullah's transactions with the world and tights China for full cooperation, even bribe Putin to join in, a Herculean task. Best strategy that stands the greatest chance of success and entails the least risk of starting an calamistic chain reaction for a collision, a co collision of the willing to borrow a phrase to rally behind the Iranian opposition. It is a democracy sending secular Iranians who are thoroughly capable of dislodging the tyrannical mullahs. The call of the opposition should be resoundingly answered by President Trump and all other nations and leaders, not only for humanitarian reasons, but in furtherance of their own national interests. But once the regime once the regime falls, it will be the greatest thing since the Soviet since the fall of Soviet communism, it will would subvert virtually virulent Islam, Islam, Islamism by creating a truly democratic secular nation allied with Israel in the hearts of the Islamic Ummah Muslim world, Muslim world. It will be an answer prayer for both the world and for the Iranians. How many Iranians would leave Islam? Millions have already left, in fact. Christianity is a fast growing religion in Iran. We need our insightful administration to see hand runs in the wall and take drastic action. The ripple effect throughout the entire Middle East would be monumental in a nutshell. Monumental in a nutshell, Islamic terrorism would eventually cease to exist. Well, it's interesting there because um, I was watching a thing on um, Ken, o Ken o Keith and he talked about how genuine the Iranian people are. And we're not too crazy about government, the government in general. Well, one thing for sure, there's been talking about secular movement for a very long time. I've been, uh, you know, checking out stuff, looked at it on myself. Folk can actually really, you know, do your homework on it. It's really interesting stuff. A lot of people don't really know about Iran as a whole. And if this is, if this is occur actually occurring, it needs to be organic. And that's really it. Let it be. Make this happen. We don't need the CIA, the MI5, anyone, and MI6 going in there and do another Operation Ajax. Because Mohammed Meloshadek was a Democratic elected prime minister. And look what happened. And many people haven't forgotten that. How the United States and Britain tangle with their affairs. In Persian, Iran means land of the Aryans, noblemen. Yes, they got a lot of beautiful people that have blonde hair, blue eyes as well, believe it or not. But one thing I could say, absolutely. No sanctions. No foreign entanglements. Let it be. The people in that nation got to make a decision what they want. And that's one thing I have to say. We don't need to invade them, attack them, and say they're part of Al-Qaeda, this and that. Yeah, they got tyranny. It's like the rest of the world. It's, it's government. You have to feed. <laughs> yeah, it's government. You have to expect tyranny from all walks of life. So let it be. When that regime change happens, so be it. Not let them revolt. Jefferson says one time, a little rebellion now and then is good. And hope for the best for the brothers and sisters in Persia. Speaking of the Middle East, here's one came from Mint Press News by Elliot Gabriel under activism. They say a campaign of repression against women's rights activists rips mask from Saudi reform agenda. When lifting the women's driving ban should have been a cause for celebrating women's rights activists in the kingdom, authority instead saw fit to engage in a spree of repression by arresting these 10 activists while attacking them in the media as traitors and embassies' clients. Saudi Arabia is going ongoing cracks on a women's rights advocate on the eve of his June 24th lifting of the ban on women drivers is meant to prove one thing 
only one man will be allowed behind the steering wheel to reform and social progress in the ultra conservative Saudi kingdom is that man is crowned Prince Mohammed bin Salman Abdelaziz Al Saud or MSB is he known? <laughs> Don't believe the hype. While lifting the ban should have been cause for celebrating the women's rights activists in the kingdom whose patience striving for further social rights paved the way for the Saudi rulers' modest concession. Authorities instead saw to engage in the spree of repression by arresting at least 10 activists while attacking them in the media as traitors and embassy clients. Photos of the prisoners are also being shared on social media, accompanied by the accusation that they had contact with foreign entities with the aim of undermining the country's stability and social fabric. According to the Gulf Century for Human Rights, GCHR, prominent women's rights defender, Lajion al Hathlo, 28, is still being held in communicado following her arrest in Abu Dhabi by Amari authority and transferred to Rida in March. The arrest came following her attendance of a review session of Saudi Arabia at the UN United Nations Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, or CEDAW. The GCHR commented, it is alarming that Al Hath Hathlo was transferred to Saudi Arabia against her will, which is part of the security agreement in the Gulf Cooperation Council countries, which leaves human rights defenders and critics risk every any anywhere in the region. Other arrests include sixty year old mother of five Al Aziz Aziz Aziza Al Yosef and Aman Al Nav Navjan a, a well known blogger and universe university professor Madea Al Medina Al Azro Arosh a psychotherapist and pioneering activist in her mid-60s who was among the group of women that challenged the driving ban in Radea parking lot 1990. Four men were arrested as well. Some of the detained leaders were active supporters to the right to drive and the hashtag and I'm, uh, I'm my own guardian hashtag social media campaign. According to rights groups and lawyers, activists could face 20 years in jail found guilty of their alleged threats to national security. They are convinced convict, they are convicted of treason they are convicted of treason or serving in a spy cell, as some state papers have speculated, they could face a death sentence. And there's um Nora Albacom talked about it here. I would uh, says I would like to clarify by stating that all men arrested were also part of women's rights act activism. One was affiliate, one was affiliate, one others was a lawyer, represented Lojan and the like around the rest of strictly targeting Saudi feminism. And of course, semi official Saudi account posting the, the kind of imagery arresting rest, women's rights activists. Red, red stamps over the activist pictures read traitor, state shocking brazen. Some of these activists gained immense popularity and credibility during an anti guardian campaign. So, it's, um, so stuff is happening in the Middle East. Very interesting. <laughs> I think it's, um, Nice, yeah. The under under the mid medieval style messianistic regime imposed on the subject of the kingdom. Males males reign over the women and their family as their legal guardian, be their be thy they father, husbands or brothers, without the company or written permission of male relatives, women are unable to leave their homes and shop and um, visit the doctor, study or travel. Is war and activism. U.S. based Saudi writer in exile Jamal Kajagi told NPR News, adding, M MBS wants people to step aside and accept what he's giving them. He will lead them into the future. Hooray! The smear campaign and company repression, which saw activist homes raided, certainly tears in the mask of reformer from the 30 year old crown prince, revealing the phony nature of his progressive. Image, image, and a limitation in his paternalistic social reform from above vision for the kingdom. MBS 
slams on the brakes. That's a question. Following his designation as crown prince by his father, King Salman bin Abdulaziz al Saud, the MBS began promising to advance the country into the realm of moderate Islam, riling those committed to the country interest. Inter oh, interpret interpretation of Wahhabi Islam has held sway in the kingdom since at least the late 1970s. Under the paternalistic regime, Saudi women are unable to wear makeup or the clothes of their choice. So the majority of women must wear a abaya, a head-to-toe garment, on pain of facing punishment fines by the religious police or a committee to promote a virtue and the prevention of vice. Throughout the past year, Saudi Kingdom has appeared to be making very modest steps toward basic progress when it authorized women to begin attending games at three sports stadiums in the ultra-conservative kingdom. Last September, the aging King Solomon decreed that women would be granted driver's, li driver's licenses for the first time, rallying up conservatives in the monarchy. Saudi rulers quickly faced a withering backlash on social media after women were granted permission to participate in the September 23rd Saudi National Day celebration in Radiz King Fahd Stadium. Rathna Begum, a women's rights researcher at Human Rights Watch, told Al Jazeera that the kingdom began to chill the activities of social rights campaigners shortly before unveiling the reforms, she said. We know that back in the 27th, September 2017, authorities called women's rights activists, including the ones who have recently have been arrested, to tell them not to speak to the media, and then hours later announced to the world that they were lifting the driving ban. Again, these arrests were happening largely as a way to silence the critics of Mohammed bin Salman's reform, in particular because these women's rights activists are demanding more than just lifting the driving ban. Male Saudi Netizens also began to mock the newly perm permissive stance of authority, asking if women would be granted permission to travel to nightclubs next. Towards the end of last year, a vast crackdown of royal family members and business elites was seen as being meant to pave the way for further reforms, but a recent trending topic on Saudi Twitter, an Arab a Arabic hashtag translating, we won't you Won't Drive shows the depth of reaction to the mildly permissive stance of the Saudi regime. And Sarah al Kobe Mahir says, men in KSA are using this disgusting hashtag to be threatened to, to threaten women who might even think of driving when the ban on female drivers will be lifted. What's, what's good is granting women's rights if they can't exercise them in safety. The arrests are mainly are clearly meant to send signals that women's rights activists must shut up and be satisfied with the rights they are granted by the kingdom's rulers rather than ambitiously seeking further basic rights reforms. Rights activists are realizing now that MBS will throttle the reforms as he sees fit in a matter that fortifies rather than undermines the sod hered hereditary monarchy. Middle East Human Rights Watch Director Sarah Lee Winston said in the statement, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman's reform campaign has been a frenzy of fear for genuine Saudi reformers who dare to advocate publicity publicly for human rights on, or women's empowerment. The message is clear that anyone expressing skepticism is about the Crown Prince's rights agenda face time in jail. Well, well, well. That's very intriguing indeed. Well, so MBS wants talks, but his actions blows. It's nothing new. It's the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Am I surprised? Absolutely not. Well, all the I can say, let the ladies over there keep pushing those buttons. Because now, with technology, they're being stripped naked to kingdom themselves with their tyrannical regime. So, I say, more power to the sisters in Saudi Arabia. 
drive them crazy, make them happen. The men that supporting the women, you got my homage. Keep it real. Yeah. So, I'll be right back. So stay tuned. Okay. So, next one we're going to be doing here. Actually came out today from John Rappaport's blog, nomorefakenews.com. It says here, breakthrough an explosive lawsuit against Monsanto. A San Francisco lawsuit against Monsanto is its recall roundup. It's moving forward. It's just received a new green light from the judge in the case. Monsanto lawyers are bracing for a deep level of attack while they are hoping to avoid. The judge has ruled the jury can't hear the testimony on this issue. Monsanto suppressed evidence that Roundup causes cancer. Reporter Carrie Gillam has a story in The Guardian. This is May 22nd at the age of 46. Dwayne D. Wayne Johnson, Johnson is not ready to die, but with cancer spread through most of his body, doctors say he probably just has just months to live. Now Johnson, a husband and a father of three in California, hopes to survive long enough to make Monsanto take the blame for his fate. On June 18th, 18th or 18th of June, Johnson will become the first person to take global seed and chemical company to trial, an allegation that has spent decades hiding the cancer-causing dangers of his popular Roundup herbicide product. In his case, has just received a major boost. Last week, Judge Curtis Carnell issued an order clearing the, the way for jurors to consider not just scientific evidence related to what caused Johnson's cancer, but allegations that Monsanto suppressed evidence of the risk of its weed-killing products. Carnell ruled that the trial will proceed and a jury will be allowed to consider possible punitive damages. The internal correspondence noted by Johnson could support a jury finding that Monsanto has long been aware of the risk that is glyphosate-based herbicide called carcinogenic, but has continuously sought to influence the scientific literature to prevent its eternal concerns from reaching the public sphere and to bolster, bolster its defenses and products liability actions. Judge Carno wrote, yes, the judge in case wrote that statement. Judge Johnson's case filed in San Francisco County Superior Court in California is at the forefront of the legal fight against Monsanto. Some 4,000 plaintiffs have sued Monsanto alleging, alleging exposure to Roundup that caused them or their loved ones to develop non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, NHL. Another case is scheduled for trial in October in Monsanto's hometown of St. Louis, Missouri. How Johnson's lawsuit plays out to be the bellwether of how other plaintiffs proceed. If Johnson prevails, that could be many more years of costly litigation and hefty damage claims. If Monsanto successfully turns back the challenge, it could derail the other cases and lift pressure on the firm. According to court record, Johnson had a job as a groundskeeper for the Bessina Unified School District where he applied numerous treatments of Monsanto's herbicide to school properties in 2012 until at least late 2015. He was healthy and active before he got cancer diagnosis, diagnosis in August 2014. In a January disposition, Johnson's treating physical testified that more than 8% of his body was covered by lesions and that he probably had a few months to live. How will Monsanto proceed? First, they'll argue that Johnson's cancer could have been caused by other factors. They'll throw the kitchen sink at the jury. It could have been genetics. It could have been lifestyle. It could have been causes that are still unknown to researchers. It could have been starlight from a galaxy far, far away. Monsanto's lawyers will try to bury the jury in reams of supposition. Second, they'll show the jury an, an EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, findings that the Roundup does not cause cancer. Like FDA, the EPA has sided with major corporations in efforts to protect them. Monsanto will claim the federal government has asserted Roundup is safe, and that's the end of our responsibility. The federal government is the final arbiter, which is to say the truth isn't the final arbiter. Third, Monsanto will execute a series of acrobatic moves to prove they never suppress evidence that Roundup causes cancer. They are simply 
considering all relevant safety issues. They were po posing various scenarios. This, their internal memos were a temporary work product on the way to making a judgment about Roundup safety. They were raising a valid concerns about flawed studies that claim Roundup was dangerous. It, if all else fails, Monsanto might try to sell with Johnson. Then the claim to pay, then the dollars payout was simply to show compassion for his unfortunate condition and move on and continue to offer a public fine and a safety product roundup, no guilt admitted. In the extreme, I need to raise this question. Mike Monsanto behind the scenes secretly and illegally offered Johnson's lawyers and his client a very large sum to present a weak case in court and let Monsanto win the case? You decide. If Monsanto has intentionally hidden the dire effects of Roundup for decades while people have gotten sick and died, what wouldn't they do? Among myriad scandal, the myriad scandals and crimes of Monsanto, here is one of the sheds light on the mindset of the company. Accessoflogic.com reports, this is from March 22nd. In 2001, 3,600 inhabitants of the city of Anniston, Alabama, attacked Monsanto for PCB, a chlorine chemical contamination. According to a report declassified by the U.S. Agency of Environmental Protection Agency, Monsanto for almost 40 years dumped thousands of tons of contaminated waste in the stream in an open garbage dump in the heart of the black neighborhood in the city. Okay, so hey, oh yeah, those, those folks there, they're animals, who the hell cares, they're numbers. The way the Washington Post reported the story is instructive. Monsanto documents many emblazoned with warnings such as the confidential read and destroy show that for decades a corporate giant concealed what it did and what it knew. In 1966, Monsanto managers discovered that fish submerged in the creek turned up belly up within 10 seconds, spreading blood and shedding skin as it debunked in boiling water. They told no one. Monsanto was finally convicted in 2002 of having polluted the territories of Aniston and the blood of its people with PCB. The firm was ordered to pay $700 million in damages to guarantee and to guarantee cleaning up the city. No legal action was brought against company officials. Interesting history lesson, correct? And of course, Monsanto created Agent Orange, Vietnam. Not just the, v the Vietnamese people, but the brothers and sisters that served. Many of them die from, from that disgusting product. So it's getting pretty exciting. Let's see how see how far this goes, and if they do a settlement, to keep them silent, it's just crack the walls a little bit. But it can it can open up a lot more further. So yeah, you know what? Give Johnson a thumbs up, and 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 the San Francisco judge for making this happen. I think it's fantastic. It's an exciting time, my friends. People, stuff, companies, false profits, corruption are being stripped naked. So all those folks who protest the uh, March Against Monsanto, keep it up. Share this with everyone you know. I think this is one exciting time. It's an exciting time to be alive. What we're witnessing, friends. Let's go. Hopefully, we'll just see how far this baby goes. I say take it all the way, man. I think it's great. All right. Finally, this is from Legal Insurrection. It says, hey, the resistance is losing. That's that authentic, uh, that's that fake movement, I call it. And all these treasonous ass clowns. Are um, saying they're trying to resist Donald Trump. And, and to be very frank, I'm not a Trump worshiper or anything like that. But I just find it called the resistance. I go, non -re non -re not rebellious enough. More of a her conformed institution or movement. So, what does Mr. Jacobson have to say about this? It came out yesterday, 9 p.m. And as it reads here, a Rudolph's LP 
SOS poll show the generic ballot for the 2018 congressional midterms in favor of Republicans. What? Republicans had a slim lead over Democrats in a, ge- in a generic ballot among registered voters, a new voters poll found, making the first time a survey shows GOP ahead in this election schedule cycle. The poll showed 38.1% registered voters said they will vote for a Republican candidate if midterm elections were held today, compared to just another 37% who said they would vote for a Democrat. The new poll was conducted on May 17th and surveyed 1,338 registered voters. For the week ending May 20th, pollsters also found that Republicans held a nearly six-point advantage over Democrats. That marked a nine-point swing from the previous week when when Democrats held three points led among registered voters. The results are a stark contrast to previous polls, which showed Democrats with a 10-point edge as of late April. That six-point Republican lead in the most recent of the rolling Reuters LP SOS polls is particularly shocking and must be an outlier. Nonetheless, the poll is in keeping with the trends of tightening generic ballot polls. CNN reported earlier this month that Democrats' 2018 advantage is nearly gone. What changed since last fall when we report reported how the how, uh, how the Cook Political Report anticipated a 2018 a 2018 Democratic wave is building in the House. At the same point, at the same point in time, Democrats were up eight points in a generic ballot, down from double-digit leads, but still substantial. It was all gloom and doom, but in the break from many generally dreadful move I wrote in January 2018, don't fall for the Operation Demoralize 2018. Sure, Republicans should take seriously that signs that the 2018 midterms could go against them. That is the history of a party that wins a presidency. Look what happened to Obama and Democrats in 2010. And there have been on the scene and the some on the grounds indication that Alabama, which was unique, the Democrats are outperforming. The the key is to motivate our voters despite the media, Democrats and never Trump Republicans efforts to get them to stay home. The lesson is not to get complacent and do nothing, but to recognize the strategy and work against it. The quote, the old saying, I was born at night, but I wasn't born last night. Much of what you're saying what you see is Operation Demoralize 2018. Generic ballot um, ball pointing is, isn't so much as the electoral predictor as a mood measure, and the mood in the country is moving in the favor of optimism as it reflected to Gallup surveys released in the last few days. First, optimism about availability of good jobs hits new heights. 67% of Americans believe that now is a good time to find a quality job in the United States, the highest in 17 years of Gallup polling. But the availability of good jobs has grown by 25% percentage points since Trump was elected president. Gallup has asked to say whether it's a good time or bad time to find a quality job monthly since August 2001, prior to 2017. The percentage saying good time never reached 50%. But since Trump took office in January of that year, the percentage has stayed at or above 50% has been higher than 60% in the eight of the past nine months. So there's a lot of optimism on here, and you can see it for yourself. Another Gallup poll showed satisfaction in which way things in the U.S. rises to 37%. 37% of Americans are satisfied the way things are going in the country today, up to 29% in in. April, Gallup has not measured the a highest level of satisfaction since the 39 since the 39% reading in the late September 2015 2005. Excuse me. So although 37% were also satisfied right before the November 2016 election, and 36% were satisfied in February 2018 after the State of the Union address. What what does this all mean? Is that Resistance is losing. The lunatic politics has taken over the Democratic Party, and particularly is its no base longer is no longer is working. Democrats have become a party of Russia, 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 and stormy, 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 and impeachment, 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 and constitutional crisis, constitutional crisis, constitutional crisis is exhausting people. 
I'm not predicting a red wave yet, but a trend. But if, if trends continue, my 2018 prediction likely will become true. Republicans will pick up net four seats in the Senate and hold the House with a reduced majority of 10 through 15. Interesting. So um, I can say this right now to be very sincere. You call it constitutional crisis. I'm like, when I hear, when I hear that from the resistance, I'm like, where the hell have you yahoos been? It's been going on for a very long time. But now Trump became president. Oh, we got a constitutional crisis. I never bought it. I laughed so hard. And I'm like, folks, they're in bizarre world. One thing I tell folks this, with you this midterm election, okay, even on the state level, got to make sure they, stay, they, they represent principle. That's it. <clears throat> Some of the people who run for governor of Florida, I am not impressed. They compromise. And they're trying to sell you the same old shagang, sh shite, garbage, kaka, rubbish, that's been going on for at least 30, 40, 50 years. Always be vigilant. Don't believe the hype. Vote for those that believe they do the job. You put their feet to the fire. I call them all. It doesn't matter what party they're in. Even the Senate race, right? They went flip flop for Scott against Bill Nelson. It's like Huey and Dewey. Please. How insulting. But, hey, resistance losing? I can care less because they're not controversial enough. A lot of people, a lot of folks that are in this movement are a bunch of New World Order saps, Orwellian vampires, treasonous scumbags. Their actions make Benedict Arnold a profound patriot. And that is it. I'd like to thank everyone for listening, but feel free to download and share this throughout your social media network. If you have any questions, comments, or you send me something that's interesting, you may want to check out. Whatever you do, please send your correspondence with decorum. You can hit me on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, Tumblr, YouTube, Freedoms Network. Hopefully they're still around. If so, donate money to them. They need it. Minds.com, FutureNet.club, Patreon.com, forward slash Lucky Luck 3 with three eyes. If you want to donate money to me, that would be great. You can hit me at Gab, G-A-B dot A-I. Free speech version, the free speech version of Twitter at endyours.org. It's a new social media site, alternative, decentralized. I may have a few more of those in the very near future. In addition, you can email me at lookingluck3 at gmail.com or to your cryptic ones. I you have a Proton Mail account. Lookingluck03 at protonmail.com. Okay, my friends, that's all for now. Once again, thank you for your time, but always remember that the maniac resistance is healthy for the soul and can liberate humanity. Until next time, take care of yourselves. Keep on spreading the love, and may your guardian spirits be with you. 